How's the mic? Who can't hear me? Who can't hear me? You can all hear me. That's brilliant. Okay. I'm assuming it's mic'd up. Excellent. Great. Now it's mic'd up. Fantastic. So, really fantastic to have you all here. We've got an incredible session today with four state-of-the-art senior leaders in conversational AI who are going to give you examples of what good looks like so that you can come, go away and create strategies with confidence. But before, before that, I'm going to start off and give myself give a little bit of background to me. So I've been creating internet software since, well, for the last 25 years. Eight of, yeah, that was at Google, and I, was, I created the first Alexa skill for the UK government. So we're about to enter an age. We're entering an age now where we're in an era of technology where the, every button, every switch that you see is an opportunity for conversation. And this changes everything. And so I'm going to bring up the, a story of the promise of conversational AI, what it offers. So the promise of conversational AI is that we can express what we want to computers in our own words. You combine that with what businesses get from that, which is they get a much better understanding of what's really important. This then equates to the opportunity for a much better customer experience. So that's the promise. So where are we today? Well, today, what's really interesting is we're going to focus in a very specific area, which is around what's been happening with this, the growth of digital assistants in the English-speaking world. And by the way, if you're interested in what's going on in Asia, we have an amazing session at 3.30. So... There are three areas, three signals that are really valuable that give you, us confidence about what we think is going to happen in the future. The first is that people are buying smart speakers in droves, huge volumes, and those who haven't are almost certainly going to buy one soon. So that's these devices pervasively through your life. They are also being very optimistic about what they're going to do with it. And they're embracing, people are embracing the nature of this experience where you have a conversation with technology. Digging a little bit more into detail, this is a survey that Microsoft did across UK, US, Canada, India, and Australia. As you can see, the number of people who owned a smart speaker in the last year has doubled. 50 million in the US alone. Also, as you can see, the planning to purchase sentiment hasn't changed, which means we can see this adoption to continue to accelerate. Then, if we look briefly at the details, you, know, you can take a photo of you like, of course. But what's really interesting here is in the shopping experience, what we're seeing is that people are incredibly optimistic about using and having conversations with technology more and more. Actually, even in some cases, to the exclusion of other channels. So what we're seeing here is a picture that is really an observation in front of our eyes of custom behavior changing. That's a huge opportunity. So I'm going to talk briefly about what my team has been doing in this space so you get a sense of what my background is here. So we have been helping customers answer a few key questions. One of them is, what tools are there to create conversational experiences? And with this, we actually created... Um, this we, um, just check these. Oh, we, we just missed a slide. Never mind. Um, so, We've, so we've had, um, so for this we catalogued over 700 chatbot technologies and we laid them out and organized them so that the people were able to make a decision about implementation flexibility versus implementation speed. That's one of our outcomes. Another one is we drilled into that to the understanding, to try to ask the question, how, how can we understand customer conversations? And with this, we then went through and we cataloged 85 different technologies in the natural language processing space and created a layout, an, an organized conceptual architecture that allows people to make sense of the pieces and how they fit together. All right. And now the, the last piece that we've been doing is asking the question, that's great, okay, this is all exciting, we're bought into the vision, but our developers are not machine learning people and they're not data scientists, what do you do? And so we've actually had a workshop where we have natural language for developers and this is where they get an opportunity to get exposure to more than 30 different natural language processing technologies. 
And there's nothing better. There's no substitute for direct experience. And they get hands-on experience with that. So that's what we've been doing. If anyone's curious about that and you think that's quite interesting for you, just ping me in some way and, and we can talk a little bit about how we may be able to help you. So, on to the case studies. So I've given you a big picture of what's going on with a key message that this is, we're observing a really substantial change in customer behavior, which is that they want to have conversations with technology. So now we've got an incredible lineup of people who are going to talk to you and give you specific examples of outcomes that you can take away to understand what good looks like. First up, we have Tom Hewitson, who's the CEO of LabWorks. Now, Tom's team won the Webby Award for the best Alexa skill in education. A skill, by the way, is an app, an application. So if you hear the word skill, it's a branding for an ability to actually provide custom functionality in a smart speaker. Then we have Jess Williams from Apollo, CEO of Apollo, who's going to talk about her experience, again, top skill maker around the world. She's coming here, taking time to share her experiences and what it's like to be on the cutting edge, sharing her insights and guidance for others. And then we move into John Taylor, who's CEO of Action AI, and he's going to give an example of what retail banking looks like with a voice experience. And fingers crossed, we may even have a demo. That's no promises, but we'll see how that works out. And then finally, this mix is a, that's the consumer part, and then finally we finish up with the enterprise story. So Dr. Catherine Breslin worked at Alexa in Cambridge, heading their AI unit, and is a very much a distinguished research scientist, and we have great privilege. Catherine was here last year representing Amazon. It's now working at Cobalt Speech, providing custom speech and uh, audio solutions for the world stage. So without further ado, I want to introduce first Tom. Give him a big round of applause. Tom, where are you going? Please. Yeah, there you go. Good morning. Uh, thank you very much for coming so early. Um, I hope you all managed to have some coffee. Uh, am I waiting for slides to appear? or I thought your slides were just a bunch of... They're, they're all in my brain. I'm going to like, <laughs> communicate them all by voice. <laughs> so we wanted to give a little bit of background on why you created a lab to start with. Would that right. Be Okay, so uh, I'll, start, I'll, start, I'll start without the slides and hopefully they'll appear uh, in a second. Uh, so, hi, I'm Tom. Uh, I'm from a company called Labworks. We make games for Amazon Alexa and Google Home. Uh, we've been doing that for about two years. Um, we, we were pretty like early into the field. So it's now kind of a, a burgeoning field. Uh, it's one of the kind of the... Um, most popular use cases for Alexa at the moment. Um, oh. Okay, well, uh, I'll, I'll just, that, that was the title of the talk. <laughs> cool. So, yes, hi, uh, I'm from Labworks. We, we've already covered that. So, uh, I thought it'd be a little bit interesting. Kind of the, I thought that this talk would be interesting to kind of tell you a bit about, like, what went wrong as well. So, it's not going to be like, a, we're so amazing. Uh, it's kind of some of the stuff that did a, didn't work out along the way as well. Um, and that kind of starts with me in completely the wrong industry, um, one that was shrinking at the time um, and, you know, wasn't, wasn't kind of, didn't know too much about tech. Um, and so in my career, I kind of got more and more exposed uh, to tech and kind of made the, uh, the shift from being in kind of a writing capacity into kind of a more technical design capacity. Um, I founded uh, LabWorks in November 2015 uh, to do consultancy on chatbots, uh, but it wasn't my first startup. I'd had one before, um, and that had gone horribly. So it, w it wasn't uh, necessarily set to, set to be a big thing. Um, now, Jess uh, will we'll know about this and may even talk a bit about it later as well. This was, this was my uh, introduction to the world of voice. So I was working uh, doing this chatbot design, chatbot consultancy for a company called Sage. And we had done a chatbot uh, called Peg, uh, which was a, a virtual assistant that helped you do your accounts. It's like small businesses. Uh, and they decided that they wanted to do an Alexa skill. Uh, and so they got Jess uh, and Oscar, her partner, to come along and make that Alexa skill. Uh, and I, I, I kind of saw it and I was like, well, this voice thing is pretty cool. I want to be in that too. 
Um, and so I thought, well, I don't have any kind of real world examples, so I better like, you know, make something so that I've got something to demonstrate, uh, and decided to make a little game over a weekend. Um, oh, there you go, that, that, that was, that was um, I, I made it with a couple of friends um, over a little hack project to the weekend, and it was a game called Would You Rather? Uh, and then about six weeks later, uh, I get this phone call. Um, not from that guy. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I wish it was from that guy. Uh, but, for a, uh, but from someone at Amazon being like, hey, do you know that this is like the third most popular thing on our platform? <laughs> uh, I literally had no idea, hadn't put any analytics on it. I, I was really lucky that I'd hosted it on a hobby dyno and so I wasn't paying for server costs, otherwise I'd have switched it off. Uh, and I, I kind of like looked at the numbers and I was like, I think if we were to kind of grow the traffic on this and launch a few more, this could become a real business. Uh, so that's kind of what I did. Um, and I went into the space of Alexa Games. I kind of closed down the chatbot consultancy and went into that. Um, now, you can see I've just put in some like key stats about the market. I, I assume most, how many people here own an Alexa? All right, yeah, good, good. How many have played a game on Alexa? Uh, have any of you ever played Would You Rather? Okay, there's a, there's a few. Um, mostly the people in my team. Uh, <laughs> good. Uh, otherwise, uh, otherwise you'll be in trouble. <laughs> okay. Um, so anyway, there's a there's 100 million Alexa devices, which is already a pretty large market, uh, and half of people that own smart speaker have played a game at least once, and 10% of people play them daily, which I, th I find an extraordinary figure. Um, and even Bezos himself reckoned that games were going to be the first kind of like big breakthrough for Alexa. So I kind of felt like I was going in the right direction with it. Uh, so these are our top three titles today. Uh, Would You Rather, on the left, as you can see, it's got a proper logo now. Uh, True or False, in the middle, that's the one that won the Webby. And uh, Trivia Hero, which Amazon nominated as its best game uh, last year. Um, so they, they've, they've all turned out to be relatively popular. Um, here's some of our other ones. Uh, some of these are a little earlier in their, their life cycle. Uh, Mental Samurai, one we just did with Fox, um, uh, that stars Rob Lowe, that's only been live about a week. Uh, the Daily Quiz, which has only been live about a week and doesn't have a very good score at the moment. Uh, Star Commander, which is an interactive fiction game. Um, yeah, anyway. Uh, so the idea is that what I wanted to kind of show is that although we you look at these like these are proper like breakout hits but we also do a lot of stuff that you know isn't necessarily a breakout hit straight away uh, and what I'm going to talk about is how we try and turn the things that aren't breakout hits into breakout hits because you know at one point true or false also had a bad score uh, and that became well, it won the Webby in the end, so you know it's it's possible to kind of take it through a process. Cool. Um, oh well, uh, that's supposed to be our tra our traffic stats um, or the number of hours spent playing our games. I think uh, I think we did. What was it uh, about three quarter of a million hours have been spent playing our games, which is about. 80 something years so in collective people have spent an aggregate lifetime playing our games <laughs> since we launched which uh, I think is a nice figure uh, cool so 60% of our users come back um, which is roughly 10 times the average uh, most loyal users play every day and our average star rating is about half a star higher than the average uh, for the top 100 game skills um, all of those are quite good stats if you're in the industry but you know probably don't mean that much to everyone else uh, okay, so this is the bit that I'm assuming you came to the, the talk for. Uh, how we do it. So, first of all, we put the player first. We actually have someone on the team whose whole job it is just to turn our players into hardcore fans by contacting them every day, talking to them, making sure that we really understand what they're doing. Hi, Yannick. Um, uh, <laughs> so, we reward them. Uh, by involving them in the development process, we, we kind of speak to them, we find out what exactly it is that they want from us, what kind of games that they want. You know, this is all kind of part of user research, really. Um, understanding the kind of the wider context of how Alexa fits into their lives uh, makes a really big difference to kind of know what type of games they're likely to play. 
Um, and you know, we actively solicit feedback in the games. You know, often that comes through as people leaving star ratings. Um, but you know, we get we get emails as well, and we we act on it and we communicate that back. So we have a really kind of positive, like reinforced circle. If we get feedback, we act on it, connect with the person, let them know that we've done it, so that they kind of stop. Two minutes already. Oh my God. Sorry, I'm like miles away. Um, all right, so I'll go a bit faster. Uh, so we make sure we pick the right things. We're very careful about ranking and concepts consistently to make sure that we pick the right ones. Um, we make sure we don't bite off more than we can chew. Uh, if you, if it takes more than six weeks to launch an MVP, it's probably too big a problem. Uh, and we don't do big bang launches. We iterate. So you know we're quite comfortable sticking out something that may not be the best thing at the start and then iterating in public. Uh, we take time to design. Uh, we make sure that we make several versions of key interactions. We do an investigative rehearsal, you know, role play to, to find out how users work. Uh, good conversation design, largely about how well you handle edge cases. So, you know, putting the time into doing that is super important. Uh, and we always go for quality over speed. We never sacrifice the design for a deadline. Um, we invest so heavily in tooling. It's probably one of our key things. We spend about 70% of our effort making sure that the recognition is good as it can be. We've developed our own NLP system that runs on top of Alexa to do that because the kind of inbuilt one isn't enough. Uh, you know, we had to build a voice first CMS uh, to, to kind of manage all the editorial content because there's a lot of content and no voice first CMSs at the moment. Uh, and we've created a tool set to work with Rich Audio on Alexa that allows us to build better, more immersive experiences than any other developer on the platform at the moment, which I'm really proud of. Uh, OK, building a strong team. So a kind of a successful product is done by a strong kind of cross-disciplinary team. We're about 50-50 split between developers and kind of content and design. Um, I think that's a really good balance uh, for a team that's kind of quite involved in investigation type stuff. Um, we localize everywhere. We support every language that Alexa does. Um, and if you want to talk about transcreation afterwards, uh, come and find me because it's super interesting and I don't have time to talk about it. Uh, right, monetizing. Um, so at the moment, this is probably the bit that you kind of like care about. Uh, the, we, we've <laughs> launched in skill purchasing um, and we're seeing an average revenue per user of about half a penny a month. Um, and a mobile gaming customer is worth about 14p a month. Uh, so we're, we're kind of, it's no super yacht yet, but, but we're, we, we believe that it is possible to kind of do that uh, 25x of average revenue per user um, and take it up into kind of same space as mobile gaming. Um, yeah, let's skip that. <laughs> uh, and yes, and eventually uh, through iteration, we ended up winning the Webby, um, which was nice. Uh, and that's it. If you want to get in touch, that's my email. Sorry, I rushed that bit. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank you, Tom. That's incredibly interesting. I think, to me, the most exciting thing about this is when you, you can see all of the pieces. When, it, when, you want, when, when, you want to be, when you go to first to market, when you want to be there at the beginning, you need to be prepared to invest in the way that Tom has done to get all these pieces that just aren't necessarily there. And to continue the story now, we've got Jess Williams, who's going to talk about her experience, also a top skill maker, also pioneering, and will share a story about the team and all those other parts it takes to build a business at that cutting edge. Jess, we'd like to join us. Can you do the lectern? There you go. Thanks so much. Hi, can you hear me OK with this? Here? Yeah? Good. Hi everyone, my name is Jess Williams and I'm the CEO and co-founder of Aperlo. So we are a startup company that builds voice apps on Amazon Alexa and Google Home. So yeah, just to, Tom gave a great explanation of and some examples of voice apps, but for those of you that own Echoes or Google Homes, essentially you can download apps onto it in the same way that you download apps onto uh, your mobile phone. And so that's what we, we make. So I wanted to start off by saying, uh, going through a little bit of our story and how I got here personally as well. So um, we were founded in 2015, so previous to this I used to work for Accenture and I spent a year there on their innovation team where the goal of the team was to produce four prototypes a quarter using emerging tech. 
So that's how I kind of came across Alexa, and this was back in 2015 before the devices were out in the UK. Um, and after kind of doing a few projects with this, we demoed it to Accenture's kind of really senior stakeholders and their clients. And it was when we were showing the kind of prototypes and, he and them hearing their brand in Alexa's voice and the kind of look on their face and everyone's getting really excited. And then looking to the US market as well where the Echo devices had been out a year and there were companies starting to build a business around voice. So that's when we kind of decided to leave Accenture and set up a uh, voice design agency. And that's uh, how we started in 2016. So we started off building Alexa skills for brands. So we were fortunate to win a hackathon that Unilever were hosting um, on voice, and that kind of got us our first contract with them, and then we were on the map as kind of the voice design agency in London to go to if you were looking to build an Alexa skill. And then that's when we also worked on Sage and the PEG project, etc. But then after a year, we kind of realized that one of the, the drawbacks was that people were um, spending innovation budget, so we couldn't iterate on the skills. So we actually transitioned to moving um, to building consumer-facing products, so kind of trying to build the next candy crush of voice. And two things really happened to enable this. The first is um, we got some funding through an accelerator program, and the second is that Amazon released a rewards program. So essentially, if you can build some of the best skills on Alexa, they will uh, hand out sums of money to the ones that reach the most users and hit the highest retention. So we kind of got hold of this information and we decided to wind back the consultancy and kind of start from scratch and decide, okay, what consumer products can we build that will kind of get us this money that Amazon is promising? So we kind of looked at which categories were working in the market and also which audience. So there's some proven use cases on voice, like there is a lot with any kind of new technology. Games and entertainment is always the first thing that people uh, really start to engage, make them engage with the technology. So it's kind of games, stories, but also productivity, because, you know, saying um, set up an appointment in my calendar or book something for 9 a.m. with your voice is a lot quicker than getting your phone out and tapping through the apps. So productivity was also an area that we were interested in. Um, and then in terms of the audience, if you think about these devices, especially in 2016, it was mainly in the home. So if you think about people that spend a lot of time during the day in the home, it's like, who are these people? Parents, parents with young children, retirees, etc. So we built about 10 voice apps across all of these categories, and kind of in the same way as Tom, some of them were a lot more successful than others. Um, we've probably discontinued about six, but there were a few that kind of stood out for us and that we continue to work on today. So the first two are Riddle of the Day and Guess My Name. So these are trivia and brain teaser games. So Guess My Name, you just hear trivia questions in different categories and you answer. You can play in a group or against someone around the world, or you can play single player. And then for Riddle of the Day, it's just a very short, simple experience where you hear a riddle every morning. The second one, which really took off, was Find My Phone. So you just say, Alexa, find my phone. It rings your lost phone. So this one is particularly interesting because Find My Phone was actually a feature of another app that we discontinued. And it was kind of one of 12 features within the app. And that app was kind of getting about 100 users a day, really not doing very well. So we decided to discontinue it, but we did take out the one feature that people did seem to be using, which was Find My Phone, and created a single app out of that. And immediately, kind of, the usage took off, and it really became one of the standout skills on the platform. It went from kind of like 100 users a day to sort of 25,000 users a day. And that really showed us that simplicity and saying, you know, what the skill does in the title really makes a difference. And I think I'll go into that a little bit more later as well with like the kind of challenges with voice design. And then the last one which we work on is interactive choose your own adventure style story. The child, it's aimed at children age four to eight. We thought, you know, parents don't want their kids always looking at a screen. You kind of want an element of entertainment and education. So this kind of like gets a conservation piece and talks about vulnerable species and why it's important to protect them all whilst helping a child save an orphan baby panda. Um, so those are the three. So some of the challenges that we kind of 
have faced and are facing as a business. Um, the first one is around the conversational design challenges. And just at a high level, the main one here is that there is no way of kind of looking and understanding everything the app can do when you first download it. So if you're downloading a phone, a mobile app, you can kind of click through all the screens, look at all the different tabs, you very quickly understand what you can and cannot do and where the limitations lie. But when you're opening a voice app, that completely disappears. And essentially, all you have to guide you is the conversational design experience. Um, so it's that fine balance of getting the user to play the game quickly or find their phone quickly, whilst also teaching them about the other things that your app can do. And it's like a constant balance of um, creating amazing functionality, but also really simple, straightforward usability. And that is why most of the most popular apps on the platform are really simple concepts. The second is retention. So there's not, there are notifications, but they're not at all, uh, they're very hard to implement and there's a lot of restrictions around them. So essentially the main way that you can get your user to come back is to have an awesome first time experience an even better second and a third time experience. And one of the ways of doing that, which kind of leads into my third challenge is generating content. If you have the same content every time your app someone comes back to your app, it doesn't kind of hit the mark enough because there's thousands of others and there's thousands of other trivia games out there that they haven't tried yet and that will have new content in. So without that mechanism to kind of notify the user and like get them hooked onto your uh, app, it's really hard to kind of get retention right. So if you are kind of like a business with a service or maybe with a mobile app platform, that's a great way of kind of engaging the user into your voice app when you're a voice first company. Um, voice is really your only way to access the customer, so you have to think creatively about how to keep them. Two minutes, okay. So the last two is also kind of addressing, you know, if you're a voice first company, what intellectual property are you kind of developing? What value are you creating in your business? Are kind of like trivia content questions um, enough to sustain you as a business long term? Will people pay for that? And the second is like developing your brand. If you're building you know, lots of different experiences on voice, how do you unify that and let the customer know that you um, are the kind of like brand behind it? So with that in mind, we've kind of um, gone and focused, especially on one skill, which is the panda rescue skill. So we kind of expanded it to become animal rescue. So there's lots of animal stories. <coughs> and one of the main reasons is its suitability for voice. You know, everyone is kind of like rushing onto the voice platform, but it's important to also think, you know, is this use case better on voice than it is on mobile or than it is on web? And we think that, you know, choose your own adventure, interactive stories are definitely, ha definitely have an advantage when you're listening to it, when it's audio only. And they can also be combined with a uh, screen-based application as well. So lots of uh, voice controlled things now have screens, so you can give like that dual experience. Um, it generates IP because you're kind of like building something. And also, in terms of revenue potential, people are used to paying for content, paying for stories. So it's one area that we're looking in. And I think the last point as well is interesting because um, when I started out in 2015, there was like really no competition on the platform whatsoever. The big brands hadn't jumped on it yet. The big kind of like consumer first products and mobile apps that we see are starting to move onto voice. So there's suddenly all this competition in industries which didn't previously exist. So it's like what industries <coughs> um, are ripe for disruption and which ones are kind of coming to the platform or have, yeah, ripe for disruption. So publishing is definitely one area that we're looking at. Because if you think there was the audio books, paper books, a Kindle, and kind of like what is next in that realm of storytelling? Will stories still be linear? Will they all have an interactive element? I think that's a really interesting area and one where kind of voice really adds something to it. How long do I have? One minute. Top tips starting with voice. This is what I'll end on. So if you are a brand, a company, a service, any or just a hobbyist and you're thinking about kind of building your first voice app, what are the three things that I would leave you with? Um, if you're not a service, so if you don't provide something like finding a taxi, ordering something off 
uh, from a restaurant. I would use a proven use case, try and think about your brand or something and create a game or something entertaining because people right now go to these devices for efficiency or for entertainment. Um, if you are a business, I would definitely invest in an in-house team because there's a lot of nuances in designing uh, for voice apps, but also in productionizing them, managing the content. We have kind of like thousands of MP3 files, all a certain length that we manage for the interactive stories. So kind of developing an in-house team is really key. And also thinking about for different contexts. We've got Echo Auto, so that's the device in the car coming out. All Fire TVs support Alexa. There's a kind of <coughs> Google Home with the screen. There's so many different devices out there, and people are using voice in so many contexts. So that's definitely something to bear in mind when you're designing your first experience. And that's it. I've been Jess Williams. Uh, if you have any questions, I'll be around afterwards. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jess. Well, so what's really interesting, if you've not got this message, is that voice is completely new. It's a completely new way of designing. And it's very exciting for people who want to design. But the hardest part is that the way that the way people think is still being discovered. We don't really know really how people work. As we move closer to designing experiences that fit us like a glove, we need to know more and more about what it is to be a human being. So we've actually got a really exciting session later on today looking at some of the cutting edge ideas around that. So this day is just jam packed full of incredible content. The next talk is about Moving from consumer to consumer to business. How does an, a, a business, if you're an existing business, how do you represent for yourself in voice? And so I want to introduce John Taylor, who's got a story about how he's doing voice in retail banking. John, would you like to come up? Thanks, Julian. I, I think I'm probably not on. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Perfect. Thank you. Hi, I'm John Taylor from ActionAI. Uh, yes, I'm going to talk about something a little bit different. Um, I love those first two talks. I'm going to talk about how we help big businesses, usually big businesses, develop truly transformational customer experiences. So the first thing I'm going to do is a bit of audience participation, if you don't mind. Um, I wonder if you put your hands up if you've used a chatbot, either voice like an Amazon Alexa, or it could be text, right? Facebook Messenger, live web chat. Okay, brilliant. Thank you very much for that. And what if you keep your hand up if it was a good experience? <laughs> okay, great. Thank you. And what if you keep your hand up if you felt you were conversing with a real human being? It felt real. It was a natural conversation. It flowed. It was it's natural. A Two hands. Brilliant. Thank <laughs> you very much for that. Um, I do have slides if they work. Let's see. So what I'm going to talk about today is... Here we go. Here we go. What I'm going to talk about is, has been mentioned before. Essentially, it's the, the way that communication is changing between people and computers, people and businesses. And the promise of conversational interfaces, chatbots, if you will, is that all of us can express ourselves naturally to a business via a smart speaker or using text. So we can say, look, get me a flight next Tuesday, but I hate Stanton. I don't want to go with Ryanair again. They always lose my luggage. Or you can say something like that, kind of like you would to a PA in a pocket, and you'll be understood. And you've understood first time, and it'll come back to you and say, no problem, we've got these three options, what would you like? And you say, oh, actually, I'm also veggie. And you have a conversation, kind of like you might have done many years ago with a PA. Okay? Phenomenal promise. Transforms interfaces. No menus, no drop-downs, no complex navigation, nothing to learn. Express yourself, be understood. What a transformation for the world, for us as users. This is the promise of chatbots. And on March the 30th, 2016, the CEO of Microsoft stood on a stage rather bigger than this and said that chatbots would be as big as the web. Well, I've been looking for some time now for that transformation. <laughs> We're some way from it, right? So there's been a lot of excitement about this. Unfortunately, where we are now, there will be a, maybe a billion smart speakers by 2025. You've heard some fantastic examples of gaming. Sound amazing to me. But if you're a business trying to build something to your customer to help them transact, get information, you have to understand them. Today's chatbots, voice and text, fail to do that at a commercial strength level. Some are interesting, some are fun, some understand some of it, 
but they don't understand their users. Not fully and not well enough to enable them to transact, to do things like banking that we work in, or even as we work and travel with a big nice travel company around things like booking flights and rail. It just doesn't work. Why? Well, let's give an example of a great brand. Uber, I think, is one of the great brands in terms of user experience. Amazing mobile service, uh, in my opinion. <laughs> now, if you deal with its, Uber, its skill um, and ask for a cab in a reasonably natural way, or certainly in a complex way, it doesn't do so well. So what are Uber's reviews like? Well, they're all one star. <laughs> useless. Now, Uber's not useless, is it? But its skill's not great. Why? Is it because Uber or engineers are stupid or businesses are stupid? Very far from it. Have they got great resource? Absolutely. Have they got good commercial people with great concepts and ideas? Certainly they have. So what don't they have? Why doesn't it work? They don't have the underlying technology to, to distill the meaning from the way that we speak. It's just too damn hard. And the reason it's hard is because the tools available typically take a very broad approach. So think of what Microsoft have in something called Lewis or IBM Watson. Really interesting tools, really impressive tools. And they go very broad. You can ask about the height of Everest and what the weather's like tomorrow and about flights, a whole range of things to a very thin level, crudely. But you can't get deep enough. You can't maintain context. You can't sustain a conversation. Because language is a swine of a problem. It's been known for decades. I'm not saying this. Everyone knows this. We've known for a long time. Why is it hard? Because just like me, people are verbose. They're ambiguous. They say more than th one thing at once. We don't say, I would like a flight. Where would you like your flight to? Paris. Is that Paris, Texas, or Paris, France? But if that's the experience, we disengage. And the trouble that big companies have had launching internal POCs and external services is that engagement on chatbots trends to zero. It doesn't do what you, in the world of mobile apps happens, which I worked in for many years. You, you manage it. Sometimes engagement goes up or down. If people are not understood, they don't engage. So you can't learn from those users because there's no conversation to learn from. They say something, it gets it wrong. You say, I want a flight tonight to Paris. It says, when do you want to go? You give up. It frustrates you, you give up. That's the problem. So you've got to build this, this technology. So how on earth do we do this? What do we do? So I haven't got long. So very simply, uh, at a high level, we started in 2015 and built a, a team of computational linguists. Uh, as you can probably tell, I'm not the smart one in the business, but fortunately, I work with some rather smarter people, thank goodness for me. And so what we developed for a long time, in a bit of a bunker in truth, I suppose, is build a technology stack that sits above or sits independently of the things that Microsoft produces to provide proper in-depth experiences. And we're not smarter than Google or Amazon or any of those guys. We take a sectoral approach, so for example in banking, and we solve that problem. We build that language piece, that thing, if you like, around banking. And to do that, we don't need lots of training data from those banks. We can build something so when it starts on day one, it understands nearly everything. It's not a mind reader, there's no magic in AI, but it understands because it's, it's dealt and thought through language. And what we do is we work with companies and we give them the tools on their side so they can do what's called managed dialogue. Because it's all right understanding people. We could tell the bank, oh, this customer means this, and this second bit about them being in their garden is ambiguous. But what do they do? They have to manage dialogue. What should they respond? What do they need to clarify? So, and they need to own that, so we give them that. We give them code, essentially, a toolkit. So they can manage all the conversation, and we tell them what people mean. That's all we're doing, telling people what you mean. It's just the difference between an experience that's perhaps frustrating and one that people uh, use. Um, I, I'm very brief, and this is not you know, just a few stats, but we reduced uh, deployment costs radically um, compared with companies that have tried to build these things internally, inverted commas, properly. Um, these are big projects, typically 15 to 18 months for large enterprises we've worked with. We reduced that to four months from, from the first meeting. Um, and really important, Businesses don't want to give a company like mine uh, control of their interface to their customers. So they, they would be crazy to do so. Nor do they want to give us all their customer data. They don't really want to do that either. They want to own the interface. They want to control it. They want to decide what happens when their customer asks a question. They want to pick the phone up to someone in my team and say, oh, we've got a, a new credit card and it's yellow. Can we? That's not where they want to be. They want to control it. And they want to control the tone of voice. Because sometimes they want to respond in a casual, relaxed fashion, sometimes more formally. So we give them that. Um, so I was asked to talk about financial services. Now, uh, I was going to demo, um, but uh, this lovely building, which used to be an abattoir, by the way, uh, that's a lovely thing. If you can see, the, this is a refrigeration part of an abattoir. For those of you who are vegetarian like I used to be, it's a bit uh, uh, discombobulating, but there you go. So if I have Wi-Fi, I will, rather than tell you that this is good, which is really quite hard to believe if you haven't seen it, I'll try. So I'm going to see if Google Assistant works. I'll ask it at the time. Okay, Google. There what? was a glitch. Ah, there we try go. Try again in a few seconds. Let's try that again. Okay, Google. 
Sorry, something yeah. went wrong. It's not on again in a few seconds. The joy of connectivity in an abattoir, hey? Well, it can't even tell me the time, so it's not going to be able to run a demo, is it? Um, so I'll briefly talk about banking. So banking is an area, and I'm going to characterize, and I won't mention the banks, so I won't embarrass anybody. Banks are great things, but we don't necessarily all love them. It's a, we use them. They're a practical tool. Uh, and there's lots of competition in banking. And uh, so banks spend an awful lot of money looking after us and call centers and all these horrible things we have to call and get frustrated by. Um, and so they deliver maybe not, arguably not the best of customer experiences at actually tremendous cost. And most of us will just want information. Have I got enough money to cover my mortgage? What's the cost of going to my overdraft? And, and a conversation about their situation. Uh, and also in business banking, and we heard about this product called Pe Peg earlier, which is a cool thing. Um, banks now want to combine businesses' bank accounts with their accounting information. So you can say, how's that cash looking? And has Alpha paid me yet? And have I got enough to make payroll? So we have built those systems for a, a UK banking group and actually about to serve for a, a second UK banking group. And it's all about supporting, and I don't have long, so I won't bore too much. It's, it's all about supporting normal stuff. Can I get an overdraft extension? I need another grand, but I need it by Tuesday. That's what we do. Um, we also work in retail and travel. I haven't got time, so I'll flip through all of this. But I guess my message, because I have, uh, I would love to demo, my message is only quite simple, which is it's, it's possible to build phenomenal customer experiences that live up to the promise of chatbots. But, would, but it requires a lot of consideration, it requires a lot of thought, and fundamentally, there's an issue around conversational design that's been discussed, and I think that's right. But actually, the first order problem, first order problem by far in voice, in my opinion, and I think the evidence is strong that this is the case, is that you have to understand what people say. And if you've tried to force them down button-based chatbots or through menus, they get frustrated because you said to them, come talk to me, book a flight, come talk to me, do this, come talk to me, buy a product, inquire about where your return is. And if they say, if they say, I would like a flight, then of course that's fine. But is that how we all talk? Look, I need a flight. I need it quickly. Can I get it by next Tuesday? I don't want to spend less more than 100 pounds. Whatever it is you want to say needs to be understood. So, so all we're doing is we're distilling the meaning from all this complex, horrific world of language, and we take a sectoral approach. So we're working particularly in banking, as you've heard, uh, in travel, and increasingly now in retail. So it tends to be with big companies. We love smaller companies. It's just that this is a, bit, this is a reasonably sizable thing to do, and you need customer experience people, you need product people, you need technology people. But you can get to market quickly. Uh, we can get big brands. We can get big brands to market, you know, in less than four months from first engagement, and they ba they barely do any engineering, which is something they like. Yet they own all the experience uh, and all the rest. So, thank you very much. I apologise I couldn't do my live demo in the abattoir. I would have loved to have done, but uh, thanks for listening. And uh, yeah, I'll speak to you later. Thank you. Thank you so much, Don. Really fantastic, and yes, we'll find a way of being able to demonstrate it at some point. I think, and the meet the speaker, we could potentially try it there after this. Maybe cool. yeah, yeah. reminds me actually the understanding. This is the great thing, right? And I'll, I'll have to quote one. Of, I think one of the most the funniest responses to a chat, but I've seen where someone said, "My cell phone died," and I responded, "I'm sorry for your loss." <laughs> so understanding is key, as John says. And and what is really interesting is there is an industry of major brands who are providing understanding in a box. But as John has alluded to, that's quite good at some level, great for the innovation teams. But if you really want to understand, then you need to do a lot more work and you need to work with really, really sophisticated and experienced people like Dr. Catherine Breslin, who's going to come and talk to you about her experience looking at natural language in the enterprise and how that can apply to all the different areas. So, without further ado, please join me, Kevin. Hi, thank you. Can you hear me at the back? Great. Thank you very much for the introduction. My name is Catherine Breslin, and I work with Cobalt Speech. We are a company who build custom voice and language technology for our clients. So I'm going to take a step deeper into the technology and talk to you about the kinds of things you might want to think about or consider if your business is intending to invest in the technology more, to, to build your own technology, to build your own platform. And there are a number of reasons that companies might want to do this, so hopefully I'll give you some insight into what they are and what you should do if this is your company. So voice interfaces have like ballooned in the consumer industry with the introduction of Alexa in 2014, Siri in 2011. So these are really new technologies. But virtual assistants are really popular. People are buying smart speakers and using them. 
And when you think of a smart speaker and a virtual assistant, you imagine a sort of device like this that sits in a room and is listening to the ambient noise to listen for its name so it can wake up and hear what you're talking about. But actually, voice technology doesn't need to live in a device like this in a smart speaker. It can be anywhere. Um, you might want to deploy it on a phone, in an app, um, over the web, um, in a car, in another kind of device, a wearable device, a headset, a close-talking microphone. Um, the technology itself is not tied to this sort of form factor. Um, and so when you're thinking about building this for your business, there's the question of should we buy off-the-shelf tools and use them? Should we make use of platforms like the Alexa Skills Kit? Or should we be investing deeper into the technology? So I'll give you some idea about where and why companies might want to be investing deeper into the technology. So, for example, you might be a healthcare company. A healthcare company has got consumer data, patient confidential data that they are looking after. They might want to keep that data close to ensure that it's handled effectively and appropriately and in, in, in compliance with all the kinds of laws that are applicable to healthcare data. So you might want to be deploying something on your own premises so that you are being confident to your customers that their, their data is safe. You might be a bank who has multiple different ways that people might be accessing your services by voice. And you want to ensure a consistent brand across all of those ways that people are accessing you. So you want to invest in the technology, the language understanding, the voice of you, your system, the voice that you're presenting to your customers, so that you're, you're presenting this consistent brand to your customers and they know who you are and who they're talking to. You might be a travel company. A travel company might be interested in all sorts of different languages which aren't supported by off-the-shelf tools. So there you have to invest in, in your own technology to support all these different languages. You might be an industry company who is deploying devices across many different industrial sites. These are small devices which are not connected to the internet. They might be dealing with very custom sorts of queries that people are um, sending to them. You might have if you're talking about controlling things in a factory or on an industrial site, the, the kind of language and vocabulary you're talking about is very different from the kinds of things that people are asking to Alexa. So you've got to deal with this change in vocabulary, this change in domain as, as you're deploying your technology. And all of these are great reasons why your business might want their own custom technology. So I'm going to focus in a little bit on accuracy. Um, Accuracy is perhaps one of the easiest things to demonstrate and how you can get much more improved performance and better technology by investing yourself. So behind the scenes, when you are talking to a virtual assistant, something like Alexa, there is a pipeline of technology that's behind the scenes that makes up the whole experience. So you start off with speech recognition. You talk to your device and it translates what you've said into words. Then there's language understanding, like interpreting that complex utterance, that, that complex thing that someone has asked, and converting it to some meaning that can be actionable, like understanding exactly what to, how to respond and what you should be doing in response. And then there's the text-to-speech, the voice output of your system. And there may be other things in there as well. You may be looking at biometrics or other information that comes in. You might have a video camera associated. So there's lots of different things that you're taking in. And each of these is based in artificial intelligence and machine learning technology. And this is where you, when you talk to one of these things, you're ultimately talking to one or more different models, machine learned models, which is going to take what you said and interpret it and decide how to respond. But that model itself is trained from some data set. So you have a speech recognition model which is trained from audio and text or a language understanding module which is trained from, from annotated labeled text data. And this data itself determines what the model is capable of. So if we look a little bit in depth at the source of data which is being contained in that data set. So if you're thinking about voice and language technology, there's a lot of different aspects of um, variation which you want to capture in your data. So you might have different information about language, about gender, accent. I mean, there's a lot of different accents in the world. People are speaking different languages with different accents. Age, your voice changes with age and with illness, and these other characteristics affect how you speak. Um, the vocabulary and the domain that you're talking about. So if you're deploying something in the financial services, or you're deploying something in healthcare, or you're deploying something in an industry setting, the 
the sorts of things, the language that people are using is going to be different across all of those. So you want to be able to know in advance the sorts of things that your, your users are going to be asking about. Other things as well, like the sort of noise levels in the environment you're going to be used, the, the kind of device that people are talking to, the microphones and the style of speaking, whether people are speaking naturally or whether they're speaking in this stilted kind of way because they know they're talking to a device. There's lots of different ways, lots of different variation that you want to try and capture in the data that your machine learning models are using. Now, it's a very hard task then to capture all of this sort of information in a very general, generic model, very generic speech recognition or language understanding model that you can just pluck off the shelf and use in all different domains. So we looked a little bit, this is a case study we did maybe a year or so ago, and we looked at what we could do if we took a speech recognition task and we custom built technology for it. So we looked into earnings calls. This was a project for a bank. So earnings calls are calls that senior leaders in the company make every quarter or every half year to report the company financial results. These are often a mix of sort of scripted and unscripted conversations. So you have scripted remarks from the CEO or the CFO of your company and then question and answers. They can be over a phone line with uh, strange compression techniques if there's video conferencing involved. They can have many different speakers and they're very specific to the company, so they have very specialized vocabulary. This ends up being quite a hard task for a speech recognition system to work on because of all these different factors. So we compared uh, two off-the-shelf sort of speech platforms um, with a custom-built speech recognition system. And we found that th this result here found that in this particular scenario, looking at earnings calls, if you take an off-the-shelf speech recognition tool, that they weren't doing very well because they weren't really trained for this sort of task. So our error rates of accuracy rates were down under 50% on this task, which is not really something you can work with if it's then going to go on and feed other parts of your voice system. But if we build custom technology, we found that we could adapt the speech recognition model to be much better performing on this kind of system. So we got much closer to 75% performance accuracy, which sounds quite a bit, but actually, if you're looking at the output of a speech recognition system on a hard task like this, this sort of performance brings you into the region where the output is usable for your downstream applications. So you can get a really great boost in performance by doing this sort of uh, custom building your technology for your business. So I just mentioned a little bit about speech recognition, but as I said, there are different kinds of technology behind the scenes as well. There's speech recognition, and there's language understanding, there's conversational design, there's dialogue management. And all of these can be improved upon by adapting them to your particular domain, to your particular business. Now, that's all well and good, but where do you get started if you, if you actually want to do this in your business? Because as the previous speakers have alluded to, there's a lot of work and a lot of involved, in-depth knowledge that you need to be able to build this technology. So we have this flywheel um, concept here where you start by, if you're building your own custom machine learning, your own AI technology, you need to start with data which is representative of where you're going to deploy this particular system. But you can't get data until you have a system, obviously. So you have this loop, this catch-22 situation where you need data to build a system, but you need a system to collect data. And so what we tend to do is have a very iterative approach to design. So we start off with a small amount of data. And from that amount of data, we can start to understand a little bit more about the characteristics of the problem that we're dealing with and the, the solution we need to build. From that, we can go through the loop and build some starting point for our models. And then we might test them out on some users. And in the first instance, maybe those users are just a few friendly people who sit in your team. You collect some data and you go around the loop again. And as Tom said, this is a very iterative approach to building voice systems because understanding how people are actually going to talk in real life when faced with your system is something that's pretty difficult to predict ahead of time. So we need this iterative approach to building so that we can try something out, see how it works, and iterate and refine on it very quickly. So I hope I've given you a little bit of insight into the technology that is behind some of these voice interfaces and some of the things that you might want to consider if you are 
thinking about investing deeper into the technology and building your own, own custom voice technology. And I've put our contact details on here, so I'm around for the rest of the day. So if you're ever interested in chatting about this, I'd be very happy to talk with you later. Thanks for listening.